Growing up, I was a reluctant prayer, despite being surrounded by prayer. At school, we had prayers in assembly, which everyone recited off by heart. But to be honest, most of the time, none of us had a clue what we were praying about. At home, my family prayed for everything. Lost pieces of Lego, parking spaces, meal times, except for some reason, breakfast. I never really knew why. I just thought maybe God wasn't an early riser. The only time I used to choose to pray was when I was in trouble or when I needed help. Prayer is one of the most universal instincts. Most people at some point in their lives pray. Yeah, and Jesus, when he talks to his disciples, says when you pray, not if you pray. So he kind of assumes that everyone will pray. And if you think about it, if God exists and created us for relationship with him, then talking to him is the most natural thing in the world. Yeah, and all our relationships are based on communication. When people learn how to communicate well, then their relationships grow and flourish. Every day. Twice a week? Yes, a lot. <laughs> no, I don't. I used to, but not so much now, though, because I, I kind of like, I have a lot of what I want now. Honestly? Well, not really, to be honest with you. Not really. I don't really pray. I sort of just meditate on things. In my own way, yeah. Well, oh, I guess only if I'm really, really scared or that I really, really want something, then I'll pray. <laughs> For help? and to talk with God. Hope for things. I wouldn't say I pray to anything specifically. I pray every day. I pray, I pray even when like things going good or like things going bad. I still pray even though I question a lot of it and doubt a lot of it, but I still find myself praying kind of often. Before I was a Christian, I can remember one time. It was in my gap year between school and university. I was 17 years of age, and I was traveling around the United States on a Greyhound bus with a, a Rover ticket. And I lost all my luggage. It was stolen. My rucksack was stolen with all my clothes and my money. All I was left with was my passport and my Greyhound bus ticket. I went and spent 10 days living on a hippie colony in Key West, and then I started to travel 500 miles every night. I used the Greyhound bus as my hotel. I'd get on at night and sleep 10 hours, wake up 500 miles away in another city, and spend all day walking around that city on my own. And I was so lonely. And eventually, although I was an atheist, I prayed that I would meet someone that I knew. And the following morning, I got on a bus in a remote place in Phoenix, Arizona, and I saw someone I knew, an old friend from school called Andy. And I just said, I don't believe it. Andy's still a friend of mine, and whenever he sees me, he goes, I don't believe it. He lent me some money, and apparently I spent it all on socks. I didn't really make anything of that. I just put it down to a coincidence. But in the last 40 years, Prayer has become the number one priority in my life. Not that I'm an expert in it. I still find prayer pretty difficult. When I start to pray, all these distracting thoughts, my mind wanders all over, over the place. And often, just in the busyness of life, I find it really hard to find time to pray. But I love praying. Why is that? Well, prayer is the most important activity of your life. In fact, it's the very purpose for which you were created because you were created for a relationship with God. And how do you communicate in this relationship? By prayer. And if you love someone, you want to spend time with them, you want to communicate with them, you want to grow in that relationship. And that's how we grow in our relationship with God. The apostle Paul wrote, through him, that is Jesus, we both, that's Jews and Gentiles, that's the whole known world at that time, have access to the Father 
by one spirit, by the Holy Spirit. So Christian prayer is to the Father. Before I was a Christian, I, if I thought of God, I thought of a kind of autocratic judge or a cosmic policeman who was out to get me. Sometimes people say to me, I don't believe in God. And when they describe God, that's the kind of God they're saying they don't believe in. Well, I don't believe in that kind of God either. I believe in the God who Jesus described when he said that we were to pray, Our Father in heaven. Jesus taught us to address God, and he actually taught us to use an Aramaic word, Abba, which is still used by children today in the Middle East. Daddy, Papa. It's a, the most intimate word that you can use to a father. And Christian prayer is like that. It's to the Father who loves you. My mum had MS, so she was really ill when I was growing up. I didn't really know life without her having MS. But besides that, my parents were like the best to me. They, were, they would do anything for me. But I wasn't the best kid. I am now, like now I'm the best. But uh, before, when I was a teenager, I, I would just lie and I would be rubbish in school. I wouldn't be like the violent kid or it wouldn't be like obvious. Like some kids get into gangs and selling drugs. I, I was like way too smart. Like I just like causing trouble that you couldn't get caught for. And over a period of time, I started to realize how you could steal without getting caught. One day coming back from the, the cinema, I remember walking through the door and my parents were sat at the dinner table and was like, Alex, we need to talk to you. And basically what happened is like, I just stole the money from their bank account and they found out. And so I ran upstairs into my room. I just remember feeling like I hate myself. Not even like who had I become. No, it wasn't like that sort of moment. It was more, I'm rubbish. Like, I'm just a bad kid. And so I piled my entire room against my door like I got my bed, my drawers on my bed, everything, and then piled it up and then just sat at the other end of this barricade. It was silent for a bit and I, I was crying and I just, my dad comes up the stairs, he knocks on the door and I just don't say anything. And then he stops and he's like, okay, I'm gonna go. But he said this thing, which I'll never forget exactly what he said. He said, I need you to know that me and your mum love you. We're just confused because we don't know what we haven't done for you. And then he, he just said, I would love it if you opened the door because I really want to give you a hug right now. And then like a few years later, I don't know what I was thinking about, but I was just thinking about that moment. I realized like that's the, like one of the most real examples of who God is that I've ever seen in my life. Just, just sort of that begging to come and show mercy. My dad's just the best. Jesus tells us to pray to our Father in heaven. This loving Father is also the creator of the entire cosmos. The universe is vast. The sun, which is 93 million miles away from our Earth, is so large that 960,000 Earths could fit inside it. Did you know that the sun is one of 300 billion stars in our galaxy? Our galaxy is one of 100 billion galaxies. For every grain of sand on the Earth's beaches, there are a million stars. In a throwaway line in the book of Genesis, the writer says, he made the stars also, just like that, the whole universe. We pray to the creator of the universe. He's transcendent, outside of time, yet at the same time, he's imminent. Prayer is to the Father, the creator and sustainer of everything, but it's also through the Son, through Jesus' death on the cross, the partition, the barrier of sin, has been removed and we have access to God. It's through Jesus the Son that we have access to God the Father. A young soldier fighting for the Union Army in the American Civil War lost both his father and his brother in the fighting. He needed to return to his family's home and help his sister and elderly mother with the spring planting on their farm. And so he went to Washington, D.C to ask the president for exemption from military service. When he arrived in Washington, he walked straight up to the doors of the White House. 
and asked to speak directly with the president. A young official standing guard told him, you can't see the president. The president's far too busy to see you. Get back out there and fight like you're supposed to. So the young soldier left the White House, not knowing how he would break the bad news to his family. As he was sitting on a nearby park bench, a young boy came up to him and said, why are you so unhappy? What's wrong? The soldier looked at the boy and began to pour out his heart. He told the child that since his father and brother had been killed, he was the only man left in his family. He was desperately needed back at the farm and the only person who could make it possible was the president himself. The little boy said simply, come with me. Taking him by the hand, the boy led the soldier back around to the White House. They walked through the back door, past the guards, past the generals, past the high-ranking government officials until they got to the president's office. The little boy didn't even knock on the door. He just opened it and walked in. There, standing behind the desk, studying battle plans with the Secretary of State was President Abraham Lincoln. The president looked up and said, Oh, what can I do for you, Tad? The little boy replied, Dad, this man needs to talk to you. Our father. He's inviting us to share in the relationship he has with the Father. Not only do we pray to the Father through Jesus, but we pray by the Holy Spirit. In Romans 8.26, Paul says, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us. Sometimes people say, I wouldn't know where to begin. I, I wouldn't know how to pray. But when you invite Jesus into your life, he comes in by his Spirit. He lives within you. And when you pray, his spirit helps you to pray, to communicate with God. And there are rewards to prayer. Jesus said, when you pray, go into your room, close the door, pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So what are the rewards of prayer? Well, one of them is peace. Now, in a world where life is so busy, there are so many things that can cause us to worry, isn't there? Things like relationships, job, family, health, and you know, the small things too. And I heard of a mother who texts her grown-up daughter saying, start worrying, details to follow. You know, it's really easy, isn't it, to go through life like that and move from worry to worry? Yeah, St. Paul says in his letter to the Philippians, he says, don't worry about anything. And instead, in everything, by prayer and petition, let your request be known to God. In other words, when you're worried, pray about it. And he says the results will be amazing. He says the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Yeah, but peace doesn't actually mean that there are going to be no troubles, problems or hard work. It kind of means being in the midst of all those things, but still having this calmness in your heart. It's a bit like the deep ocean current. And even though there are waves on the surface, there's still a real stillness underneath and that's what God gives you as you come to him in prayer. And another reward of prayer is perspective. You know in the busyness of life it's not easy to make time to pray. It can feel actually like a bit of a waste of time but in my experience when I do take the time to pray and in particular thank God the worries of life just don't seem so big anymore. The things that I'm dealing with in my life are still the same things, but through prayer, my perspective on them changes and I can face them head on. But prayer doesn't just change us, it changes situations. This is the power of prayer. Bueno, una, un día como cualquier otro, nos estamos en la mina y, y en ese día yo no tenía trabajo al tiro inmediatamente. Así que me llevé el equipo al taller y ahí hice mi trabajo y luego me fui al refugio. Entonces, al, eh, yo estaba, cuando esto ocurrió, una, esta explosión, eh, sobre nuestras cabezas a la, cerca de las 2 de la tarde, y nos deja tapados por cuatro horas, eh, con tierra, con polvo, y de ahí luego discurrimos poder salir de ese lugar, alguna manera de escapar, y realmente nos dimos cuenta que no había escapatoria de ese lugar. Dijimos la única posibilidad, se llama Dios, se llama Cristo, así que vamos a tener que orar aquí. Así que se, se hace esta reunión y se reparten tareas. Y bueno, dentro de esas tareas, eh, bueno, aparte también de, de ver cuántos alimentos teníamos, prácticamente no teníamos alimentos más de dos o tres días. 
eh, como porciones normales. Pero entre todas esas tareas, a mí me, me, me dice, bueno, que sabemos que usted es cristiano, queremos que usted nos guíe en la oración. La primera oración fue más o menos, más o menos así. Me dijimos, Señor, no somos los mejores hombres. Eh, Señor, ten misericordia de nosotros. Eh, mira a los jóvenes, mira a nuestra familia. Eh, en fin, eh, le presentamos toda eh, nuestra situación al Señor. Así que nosotros acá no podemos hacer nada, solamente nos queda usted, porque no tenemos a otro que enclamar, sino que sabemos que usted es el que escucha la oración. ¿Mm? Empezaron a pasar los días y ya empezamos a tener una oración a las 12 del día. Y esto empezó a causar eh, cambios ¿eh? en las personas, eh, ánimo, en el ánimo, en la amistad, en la unidad. El Espíritu de Dios estaba ahí con nosotros. Eh, yo no he visto hombres más humillados que los 33. Estuvimos haciendo ayunos de 24 horas, de 48 horas, 72 horas, fue lo que más aguantamos para poder que estos alimentos nos duraran en, en esas porciones de, tan pequeñas, pero para nosotros era importante. Así que duramos hasta el día 16, se nos acaban los alimentos después nosotros. Cuando al día 17 el Señor permite que nos encuentren, así que ya nos empezamos a dar cuenta que había movimiento de maquinaria y, y que nos estaban tratando de buscar en diferentes lugares. But after 17 days of praying, a miracle. A probe had found its human target. And then a simple note, proof they were all alive. Estábamos ahí, eh, bueno, orando todos los días, eh, pidiéndole a Dios que Él se los guiara y que realmente eh, nos encontraran. 65 días después del colapso, y después de 33 días de drilling, Eagle's plan B reaches the minus. Mencionar también que eh, 22 de ellos aceptaron a Cristo, eso es algo bastante importante, creo yo. Cuando estábamos por salir, ahí se producen... Eh, eh, tuve que llamarlos a la oración, tuve que recordarles que y nadie me sale de aquí hasta que no le demos las gracias al Señor. The last miner has lifted to the surface. This is the moment. This rescue has come to an end. An explosion of celebration and joy after more than two months trapped more than 2,000 feet underground. All 33 have been rescued. You can't prove the existence of God by answers to prayer. But I've found that stuff happens when I pray. It can be easy to dismiss answers to prayer as coincidence. But as William Temple, the former Archbishop of Canterbury said, when I pray, coincidences happen. And when I don't, they don't. I sometimes find it helpful to use a prayer diary or to write down my prayers. What I actually do now is to write them down in the Bible. So I use this Bible in one year and I uh, write down the prayers each year. And then when I come back to read that same passage, I can see the prayers that I've written down and I can tick the ones that have been answered and I can reflect on those that are not. But prayer isn't like a kind of slot machine where you put in your prayer and you get the answer exactly when and how you want it. Prayer's about a relationship with God. A simple way to describe it is it's kind of like traffic lights. Sometimes you ask for something and you get a green light. You receive what you've been asking for, sometimes immediately. Sometimes it's a red light and that means no. And I know for me, there have been times when the answer has been no. And when I look back, I am so thankful that God shut that door. Because, for example, if he hadn't, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now. He knew what was best for me. But there are times when it's not at all clear why the answer is no. And we may never understand the reason why. And that can be really hard. I think of an occasion some years ago when I was playing squash with my, one of my very best friends, Mick Hawkins. He just played a beautiful backhand drive and as he turned to play the forehand, he just dropped dead of a heart attack. 
And I have never cried out to God more than I did in that moment. He has six children. The youngest was six and the oldest was 18. And we had to tell each of these children it was the most painful thing. And it, it still is today the most painful thing for me. At five o'clock the following morning, I went out for a walk because obviously I couldn't sleep and I was praying, I crying out to God saying, God, I don't understand why this has happened. But I'm not gonna stop trusting in you. I'm not gonna give up praying. Corrie Ten Boom said, when a train goes through a tunnel and it gets dark, you don't throw away the ticket and jump off. You sit still and trust the driver. Other times, it's like a yellow light. Wait. You pray for something, and you don't receive what you've been asking for immediately, and you have to wait and trust. If a five-year-old asked to drive a car, you'd say no. But you don't mean never drive a car. You mean wait until you're old enough. Just because something isn't happening for you right now doesn't mean it won't happen. God's timing is perfect. I pray anytime, anywhere. I don't bow down on my knees and pray, but I do hope for stuff, and I think that's the same as praying. I pray when I want to talk to him, um, when I feel like I need guidance. Every journal entry I write is titled, like, Dear God, which is kind of weird. Oh, really? But it is. And this is the book of prayers that I always have it on me. I'm giving thanks, mostly. When you pray with your family at meals, it's like, I don't know. I think I would prefer for it to be silent, a little quiet. It's like talking to anybody. You just, but you're talking to God. Be praying in my head or sometimes just saying it out loud. I just sort of put the thoughts out there, put that idea out there, and then I go about my business hoping that things will just come together. I just chat to him like I'm talking, chatting to you right now. I'd say that there are three kind of um, tips when it comes to prayer to keep it simple, to keep it honest, and to keep it going. Um, to keep it simple means that uh, you have to make your prayer as simple as possible. Um, reduce it even just to one sentence. Um, can be sometimes five minutes, can be 10 minutes, can be half an hour. Then keep it honest. Um, we often think that we have to be uh, in a certain mood to pray. So that before starting praying, we have to be peaceful, we have to be joyful, or we have to be enthusiastic about the Lord. The reality is that the, most of the time, uh, we are in completely different mood. Um, so we are either um, worried, or we are uh, tired, or we are frustrated about something, or we are angry about something. The secret is really to realize that each one of these feelings, even the most negative one, I'd say even anger, even lust, can become a fuel to prayer, can be transformed into prayer. When I start praying, I, I just focus on what is the dominant feeling in my heart. Uh, if it is a positive feeling, like joy, I offer this joy to the Lord. If it is a negative feeling, like um, frustration or tiredness, I start from there and I say to the Lord, Lord, I'm tired or I'm frustrated. Um, and I, I kind of express all the reasons of my frustrations to the, uh, frustration to the Lord, and I, and I transform them into prayer in this way. And then keep it going. We can pray all the time. I can pray uh, for the people around me. I can just um, say to the Lord very simply, uh, Lord, I love you, or Lord, help me. I can, um, in any situation, um, when I am in a church, when I am in my room, before going to bed, um, before meals, yes, but also when I'm walking, when I'm driving, um, often I realize I'm praying even without having decided to pray, um, just because it has become a kind of habit. So keep it simple, uh, keep it honest, keep it going. Over the course of my Christian life, I've prayed in lots of different ways, and sometimes it's really useful to have a guide to help you to remember what to pray for. And some people use the prayer that Jesus taught, the Lord's Prayer, as a model. Something I found really helpful, a friend once told me, was just remember three words, thank you, sorry, and please. So thank you means trying to cultivate a kind of attitude of gratitude. 
um, praising God for who he is, thanking him for all that he's given. So I try and count my blessings before I count my problems. And it's also really important to say sorry as well. Um, I once heard of this prayer which was, so far today God, I've done all right. I haven't gossiped or lost my temper. I haven't been greedy, grumpy, nasty, selfish or overindulgent and I'm glad about that. But in a few minutes God, I'm going to have to get out of bed and from then on I'm going to need a lot more help. I always find that there's plenty of things to confess. The question often arises, well, why do we need to confess our sins at all? I mean, Jesus died on the cross for us. Surely he's forgiven us everything. You know, why did Jesus need to say, forgive us our sins when we're forgiven already? Well, Jesus gave us this visual aid. Mm, the night before Jesus was crucified, he was having dinner with his disciples. And after he took a towel and started washing the disciples' feet. But when he came to wash Peter's feet, Peter said, no, no, Lord, don't wash my feet. And Jesus said, unless I wash your feet, you have no part of me. So Peter says, in effect, well, in that case, why don't you wash my whole body? And Jesus says, no, 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 you don't need to have your whole body washed. A person who's had a bath doesn't need another bath. All you need is to have your feet washed. So when you come to Christ, your whole body is washed, your past, your present, your future, totally forgiven. And as we go through the day, we kind of get our feet dirty. So we need to start all over again, become a Christian again, just have a daily cleansing. And lastly, it's good to say, please, Jesus taught his disciples to pray, give us today our daily bread. So pray for others and pray for ourselves. And anything that's bothering you is big enough to ask God for, and you can pray anytime, any place. And there are times when it's great to pray on your own, and other times it's really good to pray with others. I can remember the very first time I prayed with someone else. It was with two of our closest friends, Nikki and Silla Lee. I, I'd been a Christian for about two or three weeks, and I was on holiday with them, and I think it was Silla who suggested, let's try praying together. So we prayed probably for about two minutes with quite long pauses and gaps in those two minutes. At the end of it, my shirt was wringing wet with sweat. I'd been so nervous just praying out loud for the first time. But it was a wonderful experience. Over the years, I found that praying is amazing. And I've seen God answer so many prayers and it's really helped in my relationship with God. And you can start today. In fact, you can start right now. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you are our Heavenly Father, that you love me and you want me to get to know you better as I pray. Help me to pray in Jesus' name. Amen.